Welcome in to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, the official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. Hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and those who cover the NBA on a daily basis. It's time to flock up. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. All right, hello everyone and welcome to another edition of your New Orleans Pelicans podcast. It is Wednesday, it is game day. Game two, same time as game one, 8.30 tonight in Oklahoma City. Pelicans looking to even up the series at one game apiece. Solid effort. The first go around, just have to finish, have to execute there in those last few seconds. Looking forward to our guest today, Mr. David Wesley, Valley Sports New Orleans, of course, analyst with Aaron and everyone over there kind of giving his take. It's something that I know Jim's looking forward to, but Jim, game two here. I Do you expect a ton of match uh, adjustments? Do you expect a different game? What, what are you kind of looking for tonight? Yeah, I think a lot of times teams, if you look at each side of the ball, I mean, for me, the Pelicans defense was outstanding. I, I don't know how much you could ask for a better performance at the end of the floor, so maybe we'll see similar tactics and strategy that they use there just because there's not really much reason to change a lot of that offensively i do wonder and, and david wesley's going to get into this a little bit when we talk with him about some of the things that they can do differently to free up brandon ingram maybe free up some other guys we'll be so interested to see how this game is officiated and if it's similar to game one i think there's a bunch of different things that they're going to have to do do to try to make more space that game was just so cramped it felt like it was played in like a box where no one had a lot of room. And I think that was why you saw so many three pointers taken. But I mean, you know, honestly, one of the reasons why I wanted to have David on was because I watched the post game after game one. And he talked about a lot of different things that I thought were really compelling, but you know, they have a longer post game show for playoffs than they do the regular season, but it's still not enough time to Mm -hmm. let somebody like him kind of get into some of the X's and O's. So David's going to talk a little bit about to some of the specific things that, Obviously, a former NBA player can know to a greater degree than the vast majority of people that watch basketball. So that's the the kind of the basis of why I thought he was perfect to be our Wednesday guest. One of the things that I'm looking forward to tonight seeing as well is, um, you know, this Pels team trying to even up this series and, and just kind of, uh, you know, make it a series, if that makes any sense to you. Because sure. I, I, I do feel mm-hmm. that, too. I mean, even on the talk show on Monday – we didn't have really a lot of fans kind of say, hey, uh, they can't match up. Or it is, you know, not like the Lakers, not a series here where you kind of right. feel like, man, you've done everything you could mm-hmm. and you just can't get over the top and over there, right. which I know you can't wait to get to later on in the show. But I, I do feel, at least in one game, that this can be a competitive series at the very least. And I think it's a series that the Pels can win. If they go and execute now, I mean, there's a reason they're the number one seed. Don't you feel like that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I know it's a cliche, but it's like when you lose the first game, you always have to try to find a way to split on the road and get that done. But I do think that even if, you know, hopefully this doesn't happen, but even if if they lose and it's competitive again, I think it's another statement of how even these two teams are. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to go into game three the way that some of these other series like for example orlando cleveland where orlando's having a hard time even getting to 90 points and they're not really in either game so far i think there's a difference when if you go down 0-2 on the road and both games are really tight than if you know you just show that you maybe you're not in the same league as this other team and based on what we saw in game one it just seemed like it was such an even game and that obviously wasn't decided until the final buzzer Uh, there's two things for me to make me confident right one, you have a matchup that's not going to change, a matchup advantage. Jonas Valanciunas, if he's healthy, is going to be a matchup advantage for you. Secondly, you saw a lot of right plays, right reads, open looks. Those threes just didn't go down, and that's how it is, right? I mean, but you saw Herb Jones open, Trey open, Jose open, Najee open. You saw those guys open. OKC is going to live with that. They're not going to change that game plan. They're going to do the best they can to make CJ and Brandon's life miserable. That leaves three other players on the court a chance to do things. And I do think we've seen this entire season. You like to say the body of work. I think that was your your, your phrase on Monday of this body of work tells me this team can do that. We've seen them do that, especially on the road. So Mm -hmm. I got to be confident if I'm a Pels fan in that 
I don't I don't see what OKC is going to do differently. It's just a matter of if the You're Pels right. can execute, if the Pels can knock down shots, and Jonas is on the floor, they're going to have a shot to win the games. Yeah, I'm with you. I think, like you said, I think the role players will shoot better. You, you I think both teams are going to say we're going to shoot better in game two than we did in game one. Neither team was even close to their norms of what they did throughout the course of the season. But for the Pelicans, to me, it's the combination of, you know, the, the, the role players that you mentioned that got open shots that didn't make them at the rate that they did, especially on the road. But also, to me, both teams' top players were inefficient to a degree. But I think the Pelicans' top offensive weapons have a lot more room to improve based on what they did in Game 1. I thought, for example, Jalen Williams had a good game for OKC. Shea had a decent game. I think he can play a little better. Chet Holmgren kind of the same way. But obviously, B.I. and C.J. both struggled with their shot a ton. So you hope that those guys make some of the shots that they've been making all year, get more efficient, and you're able to get over 100 points. And I think that if, if a combination of those things happen offensively, you know, maybe you are able to win game two just based on just shooting and playing a lot better overall. Yeah, no doubt. All right, well, let's get to our guest, David Wesley. I'm very interested to see how he compares his era and this era and if there's really that many differences. I love what Jim's doing here. We'll do that when we come back on the Pelicans podcast. All right, it's time to welcome Mr. David Wesley, analyst over there at Valley Sports New Orleans, giving us the very latest. Um, and when, when I say the latest, David, first off, thanks for joining us and giving us a little bit of your time. It, it, it's... It's one of those things where how should Pell's fans feel going into game number two here? Well, um, one, the Pelicans are a good road team, um, which they have really hung their hat on best road record in the in the uh, NBA. And also they're a good bounce back team. Very rarely do you see this team, you know, go on losing streaks because they seem to bounce back really well. So that would be a positive they now know a little bit about playoff basketball. They know the physicality, the speed, how it's changed and slowed down considerably, how they have allowed more contact and, and, and physicalness. Now you have to match that and go out there and get you a win. So I think the Pelican fans should be optimistic. David, you, you just mentioned kind of the physicality of game one. And as as you know, I'm an avid watcher of the Pelicans TV pregame and postgame show. So there was a, a bunch of things that you said after game one that I wanted to ask you about and kind of give you the opportunity to expound on that I thought were really interesting. Um, one of the things, you know, I feel like complaining about officiating in the NBA could be like an, an Olympic sport. There's people that, you know, spend like so much time doing that. And I don't I don't really want to spend a, a ton of time complaining about the refs in term. I'd rather yeah. kind of spin it forward and just – one of the things that you said that I thought was so interesting to think about was you mentioned how kind of 1990s style physicality and basketball and, and even in the officiating the interpretation of the game that way could be to the Pelicans advantage. And uh, what did what did you mean by that? Like, what are some of the ways, you know, what people are going to complain about refereeing? But if you think about it, that, that it might be a positive if the game is allowed to be more physical and that kind of thing. Well, so. So there's two things about the officiating that that have drastically um, kind of came to the forefront, and it, one is is allowing that more physicality uh, stance. In the '90s, we went from really physical, a lot of hands, a lot of touching, hand check, to even more physical. So mm -hmm. the adjustment was not as great. Right now, from what you've seen, and there aren't very many people in the league that meant, that played in that physicality era right maybe lebron in 2003 2004 but the rest of the guys they've been used to this hands-off kind of defense so the people that are using it to their advantage are the guys that are saying okay i'm gonna play physical until they don't until they don't allow it whereas some of these guys are coming out they're trying to play the old style and it there there's just they're 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 not able to get away with the hand checking mm -hmm. and things Complaining about the officiating, it seems to be pretty consistent in the sense that they've all allowed almost 90s basketball to be back. The scoring has gone down. The pace has slowed down. I love it. Yeah. But to, 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 to be able to play more physical than you have in the, in the regular season can be to your advantage. You can guard better. You can stay in front of guys better. 
um, and you can set a tone to start a game that that complaining about the officiating is probably not going to change. So why don't you get on board? Mm. Yeah. You know, one of the things I was wondering about from your experience as a player, too, everyone has discussed a lot the last couple of days about how Lou Dort played against Brandon Ingram in terms of how physical he was and how he really got into him. When you were a player, how did you counteract somebody just being really physical with you? What were some of the things that you did to say, this guy has been a little handsy and hip-checking me, so this is my counter move to that? Better screening to get him open, to get to get to his spots. Um, because of his, because of, of Dort's physicality, you don't want to have to wrestle with this guy. Mm. I, think, I think Brandon Ingram's advantage is to create the space um to 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 try to not be in post up as much because Lou Dort is stronger more physical that's not his advantage and it's going to wear his legs down they have to get him on some catch and shoots um where he's coming off 10 downs and and getting to his spot and they have to try to find a way to set better screens so that they can get that switch so that he can get the matchup he's looking for. One of the things that people always talk about with the playoffs, and I feel like it's been this way since the beginning of when I started watching the NBA, is they always talk about how the tempo always slows down. From your mm-hmm. experience as a player, what do you think that the reason for that is? Is it is it you know teams get more careful? Is it the way that the game is coached? I mean, maybe there is some of what we talked about with the officiating why do you think that is that you know it, it pretty much always slows down and you have a season where we had a lot of games that were 130 to 125 and then in game one it's 94 to 92 i i think it's familiarity to some to some degree why teams don't get out and run as much it i don't i don't really i don't really know what that answer is other than you know i, I know the physicality changes but does that change you from getting out in transition it shouldn't um, the physicality changes, which seems like it'd be more steals and turnovers. Again, mm, yeah. transition, making the score go up. But traditionally, and every year, even in, in my era, yeah, a good high game was 105, 110 points, mm-hmm. where, you know, in the playoffs, it turned into 90s. Now, teams that score 120 are down around just over 100 are also in the 90s. So um, it's, a, it's a weird thing to 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 just be for no reason, but even the highest scoring teams, their scoring has come down. When you played, did you feel like maybe there was more of a priority, for example, on transition defense in the playoffs? Like that was something that was coached that they said like, okay, we need to make sure we get back more. I mean, I'm sure it's always an emphasis, but maybe in the postseason, it's, it's more of a, of a factor or something more that teams just don't want to allow those easy baskets. Yes, and yes and no, because like you said, wouldn't you be coaching this all year? Right. Wouldn't you be saying, True. we got to get back in transition. Hey, we got to push the basketball. Hey, we got to defend this way or that way. Um, the only thing that changes is being more familiar with with teams and players in a sense that, let's say you got a guy who always leaks out. Well, he may get three of those a game. In the playoffs, he may not get any because we know that's what you do. Um, right. Mm. Or or guys that, that, that throw the long outlet passes. You know, now you're aware of that. Maybe you're picking up the guard that gets the long outlet passes and making him go back towards the ball, again, slowing down a, a what would potentially in the regular season be a, a fast break. So, you know, I don't know if I could put my finger exactly on what slows it down, but it definitely slows down. Yeah, no, I think all of what you said makes sense in terms of you're just able to lock in – a lot more specifically on what one team is doing. I mean, you have stretches in the regular season where you might play 15 games in a row against 15 different opponents, and you never really have a chance to kind of scout them to that degree that you obviously do in the playoffs when you have multiple days to get ready for game game one, no matter what your team situation is. So I, I think that a lot of that stuff kind of adds up. Um, you know, another thing that you said on the post game that yeah, I thought, hold on, hold on. sorry, go yeah, ahead. Can I, can I, um, the, you, um, something about what you just said. Say it again. You were just talking about. Uh, now I was saying that w- in terms of being able to lock in on one opponent is so much different in the playoffs than it is during the regular season because you're jumping from team to team. Oh, I was going to say that sometimes 
even in the scenario you get gave, you play a team in November and then don't play them again until January. Sure. So it's not mm-hmm. even, it, you know, it's not even like even a playoff series. I think that's why some of those back to back games become so much more interesting because you do get to see teams kind of lock in on exactly what you want to do and try to take that away. Sure. You know, another thing you you said that I thought was also really interesting after game one was you talked about with Aaron Hardigan about how the late game offense and maybe just offense in general is a lot more unpredictable now than when you played in terms of maybe the play calls are there's more maybe some more more ball movement. There's less of a of a thing where every team has their one or two staples that they go to over and over again. Can you kind of expound on that of just how that affects offenses and i'm sure in terms of the last couple minutes of games that's got to be a huge difference in terms of you know maybe 20 years ago teams the team that you're you're playing against even like everybody knew exactly what a team was going to try to go to whereas now it seems like it's more flexible maybe it yeah it's more you know who's ever in the spot so let's go back to the 90s Uh, let's take the houston rockets when they won their championships close game down the stretch where are they going I don't I don't have to be a basketball guy to to know where they're going with the basketball. Right. Mm-hmm. They got a collage one on the block, right? So they're gonna go and they're gonna run a cross five, a uh, a uh, uh, turn five, anything to get the ball to him. Now, guess what? You got your best ball handler with the basketball, delivering the ball to the best player on the team. And if they double, now it's a keen job to find the right place out of it. But you know where the ball's going, you know what you're looking for. There's not a whole lot of judgment here we're going to our guy whereas now it seems to be more they run actions because they're less predictable and those actions could end up with your worst shooter perimeter shooter with the basketball with you know when it's time to go or uh your worst ball handler uh, your worst passer mm. and now you have turnovers or missed shots at the end of games whereas you know, you knew exactly what you were trying to get in the 90s. Now, times you you don't get that as much, but it's it's harder to guard. You don't know where that, you know, obviously, you know, you, everybody's paying attention to guys like Zion, uh, Brandon Ingram, and, and CJ, and then her back cuts and gets a layup because they're so focused on that and the movement and all that. But it also leads to sometimes turnovers, the wrong guy having the ball at the wrong time and the wrong guy shooting the ball at the wrong time. So it's just a little different hmm. than back in when I played. So, I mean, is would you say that, I mean, I'm sure there's a bunch of reasons for this, but is part of the evolution of that change just that kind of offense is trying to be more creative or trying to make the defense have to guard more things or be more aware of different things? It, it seems like I know one of the trends we saw, we saw this, you know, over the years is, during the Elvin Gentry area too, there was always the 0. 0.5 thing where it's like, they don't want the ball sticking. They want it moving. So, I mean, how much yes. of that do you think is, is just, like I said, kind of the evolution of, of the way that offenses have tried to get more complicated to make it less easy for defenses to kind of just focus or hone in on one thing. Yeah. Th- think about the speed and pace of the game. Now, you know, you have more space to operate. You have, you have better and longer distance shooters, than you've ever had um and you 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 really like that but you know in my time it was more bump and grind and you kind of knew exactly the the 10 basic plays that another team was going to call now there's Mm. so much unpredictability because there's so much flow and it it makes for better entertainment my era was a lot of one-on-one and pick and rolls (laughs) isolation that's not fun to watch anymore um for a lot of games, you know, and, and you'll hear, you know, guys that cover the game talk about, you know, the Pelicans had 20 assists in the first half and had three in the second half because it turned into isolation ball. They don't, you know, this league doesn't want that players don't want that coaches don't want that. They want, you know, the pace to be up fast, fast, fast and the space. So, you know, you can shoot a lot of threes and that's what, you know, that's what fans now are, are loving to see, but, you know, sometimes it gets to the ridiculous where you come down on a three on one break and you shoot a three. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I love the pace and space, but a, a guaranteed layup is better than a, a possible three. Hey, you go go get the guaranteed layup, get fouled. 
and you got the same result, and it's a better play. But yeah, you know, I I love I I love parts of the game the way it's played today, and some of the, some of it drives me crazy. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to stack a bunch of uncontested layups on the break. I mean, the threes are great, but if you get if you can get 10, 12 uncontested layups that are always going to be two points, I think that definitely adds up. One well, last thing I was going to ask you too, David, from your experience as a player, I mean, I, I would imagine that you had all different offenses that you played in. I mean, for, for the kind of player that you were and the role that you filled, was it easier for you to ha- to be on a team where it was like, you know, okay, Jamal Mashburn's going to get the ball every time or the vast majority of the time? Or was it easier for you as a player when it was more of like a shared approach where you had three or four guys that were relatively equal in terms of um, how likely they were to be the guy that got the biggest shot of the game at the end? Man, that's 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 a really difficult question, uh, you know, because I enjoyed my time of playing when I knew, you know, two guys were going to take the majority of the shots and and and, you know, I was going to get these two plays a game. I was going to get these two plays a game, but I also love when, you know, sometimes the the game got kind of junky or we, the, you know, this team was a big double team team and I got a lot of shots that night. Yeah. See, and I, mm-hmm. what's great about today's NBA is I think there are more people that have come from nowhere and turn into stars mm-hmm. than in my era because the stars were the stars and the role players were the role players in my era. Now you're going to see more guys that come from like our Herb Jones came in the league, wasn't offensive in this style. He can all of a sudden become, you know, right now, you know, he's up over double figures. He can come a 17, 18, three and D guy and all of a sudden become this star and people, you know, have to worry about him. He's making big money because he's now making it all NBA. I think that would happen more in this era. So I like that for myself. I I would like to play in this era and see what it looks like. I think I could add average probably career wise, you know, another seven points, maybe seven to 10 points, maybe because I'm going to get more opportunities. People now coaches now approach the game with encouragement. Mm. It wasn't like that in the nineties. Hey, I don't want you shooting that shot. <laughs> right. You know, now right. It's, like, hey, it's interesting. That shot. So um, it's different. I, one last story. And um, when I was at Baylor uh, in 2009, Quincy Acey started his career 30, uh, 30 baskets straight he made or some some record he set as a freshman because all of his shots were dunked. Mm-hmm. He gets in the league, right? He's an inside player and he, that's all he's ever been. I'm watching TV. I'm watching him play. And I don't remember what team he was playing for at the time, but we played them the next night. So I was watching the game, scouting for the next night. And he came, he came out, um, he came down on a break, ran to the three-point line, shot a three. Then he came off a down screen, catch and shoot three. When he got to the green the next day, I was like, what, what, what are you doing, man? All of a sudden, now you're a three-point shooter? He said, they get mad at me if I don't shoot them. Yeah. And I think his career was shorter because now he turned into a three-point shooter after he was so dominant, rebounding the basketball, mm. blocking shots, and playing inside. He was never really a three-point shooter, and it kind of got him away from his strength. Yeah, I remember him being a really rugged kind of four-type player, like a bruiser, rebounder. Yeah. But, yeah, that's that's yeah. interesting that the way that things have evolved. I, I, I think it's – I mean, obviously you have to listen to your coaches, but you always have to kind of go back to what your bread and butter is as well, or else, like you said, you might not be in the league for too long. So that that's an interesting story. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Dave. No, I was just saying, yeah, that that's, um, you know, I, I sometimes you worry about that. But like I said, I think there will be more guys that are able to shine and show their game in today's NBA than, than I would say in, in you know, 80s and 90s. Back. The only question for you, sir, is obviously when you look at uh, adjustments in between games and such, how, how much do you think when a game is that competitive and that close, 17-17 after one, 43-43 at the halftime, going down to literally the last 90 seconds, do you expect many adjustments or do you kind of expect a similar game tonight? I, I, I think I think when when you have certain players that are that are that are going to give you problems, yes, even in a close game, you may make an adjustment. But for me, they played the right game. They played an excellent 46 minutes. Excellent. It's that last two minutes where they have to execute, make all the right plays, 
uh, and get a little lucky. That, that's that's where the Pelicans are going to struggle, and they haven't done it well all year. But they're going to have to, because this game is so close, they're just going to have to simply play better, make plays, and do the things necessary to win a game at the end that they haven't done all season. Mr. David Wesley, uh, Bally Sports New Orleans. As always, man, appreciate the time, and hopefully the series will be knotted up at one, huh? Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome back. That was awesome, Mr. David Wesley. Uh, I love the insight on that, too, because it, I, it is different eras, but basketball is still basketball, and, he, and he's right, especially on that one thing. And I, look, I know they're doing it. I'm not picking on him in particular. It's just one of the more recent plays, but like Larry Nance under a basket, ready to dunk. Instead, he passes to a wing three mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. when yeah. he's wide open on a fast break. I love when he said that, the three to one. It drives my dad nuts, and he's 70, though. A so lot that, of dads, I think, have no a doubt. problem with that. He's yeah. like, dunk the ball, you know? <laughs> and, and look, and that was the thing, because you go back to Monday, and, and that possession tied with 90 seconds to go. Pels get four offensive rebounds. They launch three threes. Finally, Larry Nance goes to try to dunk it, and he gets blocked. But that's the thing. I mean, that, that's literally what David Wesley was kind of talking about. Now, it wasn't a fast break, but that was those are the shots that teams in today's NBA feel that are the ones they want to take. You know what's so interesting, too, and this is something that people talk about a lot in basketball the analytics part of it is why is one reason why the three point shot has become more common. And over the course of eighty two games, taking more threes makes so much sense. I mean, it's simple math. But sometimes in the playoffs, you just need one basket. You don't need you you, you need any basket. And I think that was a possession where that was a good example of that. That it's better to take a shot that is only worth two points, but you have a seventy percent chance of making it than it is to take a three pointer that's contested that you might have a thirty five percent chance. Because you just need one basket. And if I can use a, a, a cross-sport analogy, it kind of reminds me of baseball, how in the regular season, if you're always trying to hit home runs and you're not trying to bunt, that makes sense. Yeah. But sometimes in the playoffs, you just need one run. You don't need a three-run homer. You don't need a bunch of runs scored over a six-month season. You just need one specific situation where you need to execute. And I think that's the comparison. And as far as David goes, you know, another reason why I thought the timing of him having him on That game one was like a time machine. It was like going back to 20, 30 years ago. It really was. And I think that was... 17-17 at the end of the first quarter. Right. And if you look at the officiating, that was the part of it that I thought was... It's such an interesting discussion, and it comes into play so much more when we see a game that's played like that, that's completely unlike um, the 99% of the games that we saw this season. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, All right, it's time to get to, I know, the topic you can't wait to get into. Yeah, for you know, for Western Conference Wednesday, let's talk about that Monday night game between the Lakers and the Nuggets. Yeah, let's Lakers were looking like they were in good shape to mm-hmm. split the series one one. And that it didn't up. make you very happy. No. no, I wasn't real pleased. But then, but the, then, but then the Nuggets came back <laughs> and made everyone happy in the Crescent City oh. with an amazing comeback. And what a shot by Jamal Murray at the buzzer to win the game and and Nuggets go up two zero. You and I have talked about this, not only this season, but even before I started doing the podcast with you guys and stuff. When he was out, I mean, the first, it, it, not, I think it was the bubble year, right? He and what? He was, was phenomenal in the he bubble. He was amazing. But then he and was he got hurt. The next hurt. year, yep. It, it, mm-hmm. was, it was awful. And you saw the difference, though, that he made last year in their, in their championship run. He makes that big. As good as Jokic is, when you got a guy that can do that, because that's not anything new. That's something he's capable of doing. Right. He's physical. He can play defense. He can do those things. And I love how all of a sudden, I guess, players will use whatever to motivate themselves. But there, a list came out, apparently, the players put out, or Gilbert Arenas, or somebody put out there, of most over... Um, overrated? Overrated really? and then underrated players. And mm. he was on there, and he... He said he's tired of being called Bubble Murray mm-hmm. or something of that nature. Yeah. So he wanted to kind of show that. But mm-hmm. look, AD, the day before, was complaining that he wasn't in the NBA awards list. Right. Mm-hmm. And we're yeah. going to do something with that here later on in the week in the radio roundtable. But he was complaining that he wasn't even on a finalist for defensive player of the year. Right. Anthony Davis is a very good defensive player. He's also seven feet tall. That shot that Murray did was unreal. And if you listen to him in that post game. That's the thing when we talk about with players trying to create their own space and and their own shot. When mm-hmm. you, you'll reference it, I'll reference it. Players that can create their own shot. That was a textbook example. You heard him say, 
I knew where I wanted to get to my spot. I got there first. That's how you shoot a jumper over a seven footer. You don't know where mm-hmm. you're going. And you, he knew he was going to go to that baseline. When the second he got there, he did the step back to create his space. And then he, he shot a shot. But that's the thing, Jim, right? I mean, when you think of a player that can create their own shot, that that's as textbook as you can get right there. It was. It was a phenomenal play. And I think one of the things that was really interesting to me about that game or his performance specifically was he didn't have a good game. and But in the no, fourth quarter, he, he was able to come through like that. So credit to him for the fact that he makes you know the biggest shot of the season after he really his first seemed like his first three quarters he was having a rough time getting uh getting going yeah no doubt well we'll see what takes place obviously the rest of that series but yeah. uh what and by else the way i wanted on? to mention too real quickly before we go yeah that you know you could look at it two ways if you're a, a not a lakers supporter uh-huh. if you're a lakers hater you might even say okay um if they sweep that series the pelicans if the nuggets sweep that series pelicans game four is going to be eight thirty. If the Lakers are able to win a game, that game, the Pelicans game four against OKC in the Smoothie King Center will be a little bit early, uh, earlier, I believe seven or seven thirty. So that's just something, kind of a side note to follow that the 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 start time of game four for the Pelicans will be directly related to whether that Lakers Nuggets series is still going or not by game five. No. Oh. That makes a lot of sense when you look at it from that perspective. And hopefully we'll be talking about game six, game seven, or not. I, I, I'm good with four straight wins for the Pelicans. I that'd, mean, be, how, that'd be great, too. Yeah, you want to look sure. at it that way. Either way, that works. Mr. Jim Eichenhofer, give a follow. Jim underscore Eichenhofer is the way to do so over on X. And, of course, Pelicans.com. We'll see you again on Friday on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Join us three times per week on Pelicans.com, the Pelicans mobile app, the iHeartRadio app, or where you get your podcast. And be sure to give Jim and Gus a follow on X at Jim underscore Eichenhofer and GCAT underscore 17. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast.